Hi, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. And thank you so much for utilizing this resource. Our hope for you and anything that we provide is that you would expect transformation, that we could demonstrate love towards you because of the love of God demonstrated to us, that you would have the faith stirred in you to deal with obstacles and to see opportunities, and that ultimately that the kingdom of God would be revealed in every area of your life. And so our hope with this resource is that the Lord would speak to you powerfully. So we've been, uh, we've been going through Exodus, and this morning we're going to get to this giant um, passage of Scripture, and everything is going to kind of come to this crescendo, and it's going to be gnarly. Uh, but so far, as we've been going through these first 12 chapters of the Exodus, we've seen um, God's plan of rescue, that God has this plan of rescue for his people. And even beyond that, he's been showing that he's the rescuer. And systematically, he's been um, just destroying the image of all these lowercase g gods, these Egyptian gods, as he's been showing himself to be the living God. And so there's been this huge buildup. And uh, Ted Thomas preached uh, last week um, on God making this proclamation that this, this 10th and last plague is gonna be the, um, the taking of the, the firstborn of the Egyptians. And um, this morning we're gonna see that fulfillment of the 10th plague and we're going to see um, Pharaoh release Egypt and uh, release Israel. And we're gonna see Israel being led out by the rescuer. Um, we have a main idea. And it's kind of a doozy, but this is a big, big portion of scripture. So I had to go big with the main idea. God rescues his people from slavery while redeeming his firstborn son, Israel. Redemption and therefore adoption requires blood and sacrifice. God institutes the Passover celebration to remind Israel of the links God went and the price paid. The Passover points directly to the Last Supper and our redemption and adoption. So if you guys want to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12, we're going to read through this together. Um, and what I want you guys to pay attention to, and this will be underlined on the screen, uh, and I think we got all of them, um, but we'll see. If, if we miss any of the underlines, definitely point it out to me. Uh, but we underlined every time the Lord did something, he commanded or he actually moved. Uh, and then we also underlined every time the term firstborn is used. And so as we read through the scripture together, pay attention to how many times the Lord did something and how many times the term firstborn is used. So we're gonna start uh, Exodus 12, verse 29. And we're just going to read the whole thing through together. Now at midnight, the Lord struck every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and every firstborn of the livestock. During the night, Pharaoh got up, he along with all his officials, and all the Egyptians, and there was loud wailing throughout Egypt, because there wasn't a house without someone dead. He summoned Moses and Aaron during the night and said, get out immediately from among my people, both you and the Israelites, and go, worship the Lord as you have said. Take even your flocks and your herds as you asked and leave, and also bless me. Now the Egyptians pressured the people in order to send them quickly out of the country. For they said, we are all going to die. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls wrapped up in their clothes on their shoulders. The Israelites acted on Moses' word and asked the Egyptians for silver and gold items and for clothing. And the Lord gave the people such favor with the Egyptians that they gave them what they requested. In this way, they plundered the Egyptians. The Israelites traveled from Ramesses to Sukkoth, 
about 600,000 able-bodied men on foot besides their families. A mixed crowd also went up with them, along with a huge number of livestock, both flocks and herds. The people baked the dough they had brought out of Egypt into unleavened loaves, since it had no yeast. For when they were driven out of Egypt, they could not delay and had not prepared provisions for themselves. The time that the Israelites lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that same day, all the Lord's military divisions went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of vigil in honor of the Lord because he would bring them out of the land of Egypt. This same night is, honor, is in honor of the Lord, a night vigil for all the Israelites throughout their generations. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner may eat it, but any slave a man has purchased may eat it after you have circumcised him. A temporary resident or hired worker may not eat the Passover. It is to be eaten in one house. You may not take any of the meat outside the house and you may not break any of its bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate. If an alien resides among you and wants to observe the Lord's Passover, every male in his household must be circumcised and then he may participate. He will become like a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat it. The same law will apply to both the native and the alien who resides among you. Then all the Israelites did this. They, ju they did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. On that same day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt according to their military divisions. The Lord spoke to Moses, Consecrate every firstborn male to me, the firstborn from every womb among the Israelites, both man and domestic animal, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day when you came out of Egypt, out of a place of slavery, for the Lord brought you out of here by the strength of of his hand. Nothing leaven may be eaten. Today in the month of Abib, you are going out. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hethites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors that he would give you a land flowing with milk and honey, you must carry out this ceremony in this month. For seven days, you must eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day, there is to be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread is to be eaten for those seven days. Nothing leaven may be found among you, and no yeast may be found among you in all your territory. On that day, explain to your son, this is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Let it serve as a sign for you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead so that the Lord's instructions may be in your mouth. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with a strong hand. Keep the statue, keep the statute at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your ancestors and gives to you, you are present to the Lord every firstborn male of the womb, all firstborn offspring of the livestock you own that are males will be the Lord's. You must redeem every firstborn of a donkey with a flock animal. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. However, you must redeem every firstborn among your sons. In the future, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, by the strength of his hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of humans and the firstborn of livestock. This is why I sacrificed to the Lord all the firstborn of the womb that are males, but I redeem all the firstborn of my sons. So let it be a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead, for the Lord brought us out of Egypt by the strength of his hand. Okay. 
Good job, you guys. You hung in there. We made it through. Um, let's pray and then we'll, we'll talk it over. Lord, um, be with us this morning. Uh, this, was a, this was a long passage, um, but this is your word, Lord, and we know that it is... Um, that you are the one that gives us understanding. So we ask that, that you would do that this morning, that by your spirit, you would give us um, um, understanding of, um, of what these words mean, but also how it applies to, uh, to us today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm gonna really quickly just kind of go through the flow of what we just read. Um, so God says he's going to do this. This was what Ted Thomas covered last week. God says he is going to destroy the firstborn of the Egyptians and that Pharaoh is going to release the Israelites. And so that's what happens. Um, there's this Passover, the Israelites, they paint the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the doorposts and the destroyer passes over their houses and he destroys the firstborn of the Egyptians. Um, it's kind of cool that this wasn't necessarily ethnic, right? It wasn't that the destroyer just chose the Egyptian houses, but all those that were spared were those that trusted in what the Lord had said. So the Lord said, paint above your doorpost with the blood of the lamb and you will be passed over. Um, so it was those that, that trusted that the Lord passed over. Pharaoh immediately summons Moses and Aaron and tells them uh, they can bail. And he concedes to everything they were asking. Uh, in the other plagues, Pharaoh would put stipulations that only the men can go or you can't bring your flocks. But at this point, he says, just go. Um, in fact, all of the Egyptians um, push Israel out as well. Um, it says that there was this great wailing. So you can imagine just the pain of death touching every house. At this point, they say, just go, just go. Um, and, it, and Israel begins to go and they, they grab their bread. They're without leaven. Um, again, like we learned last week, they had their staff in their hand and their cloak tucked in and they were ready to go. Um, when I tell my kids to get ready and get their shoes on and brush their teeth, maybe they listen. Clementine does, the other ones don't. Um, but when, when my wife, when their mom, like really puts her foot down and says, it is, we are leaving in five minutes, the kids get ready because they know that they are leaving right then. Um, this preparedness that, um, that the people had that, that the Lord commanded through Moses and Aaron was these people were ready. They were trusting that the Lord was gonna do what he said he was gonna do, that he was gonna rescue them. Um, they don't even have time to put leaven in their bread. They are ready to go. Uh, and the Egyptians give them gold and silver and clothing that they asked for, um, fulfilling what God said, again, that... Israel would plunder Egypt. And, and we could look at this as just wages of slave labor, right? Uh, 430 years of slavery. Uh, they leave with, with this goal, with provision, with provision. Um, and this, the text, there's this further development of eating the unleavened bread and celebrating the Passover, and so it's got to speak to just our nature to forget, right? We've seen God do amazing things for us, right? In our lives and through our lives. We even sing that song this morning, all my life you have been so, so good. But how easy is it to forget what the Lord has done? All I need is some circumstances and I forget all that the Lord has done. So God is so gracious that he, he charges us to remember. And so uh, all of this instituting of the Passover meal and this celebration of Passover that's gonna come when they get into the land is just to, to cause Israel to remember that it was the Lord, it was the rescuer that rescued you. 
So there's all this talk about celebrating the Passover meal and who can participate in this. And in, in the beginning, it sounds like it's really exclusive language, right? Like God is saying, these are the people that may not eat at the Passover, the slave, the alien. And then there's a flip-flop. And then it's, it's really inclusive. It says, actually, the slave and the alien, they may eat, but they need to join the covenant people through circumcision. So they need to join the family of God. This is a family celebration that God is setting up with the Passover. And it's inclusive and it's open to people other than those that are just born Israelites. So there's people that are born by the blood. They're born Israelites. They're circumcised. And then those that join the covenant people, right? They're circumcised too. So there's this blood entrance into the family of God that celebrate this rescue and this rescuer, Yahweh. So much of that language that's said over and over and over again is that God is fulfilling this rescue and that he is the rescuer. It says, remember this day when you came out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery for the Lord brought you out of here by the strength of his hand. Can't tell you how many times that God has done something amazing in my life. And in such a short period of time, I start to take credit for it. I forget that it was God that does what he does and did what he did. And I start thinking, yeah, it was pretty smart of me. That was pretty good of me to do that. I am pretty clever. I rob that glory or attempt to rob that glory from God. But over and over again, God says, remember, remember it was the Lord. It was the Lord that rescued you out of slavery. It was not you that did this. It was I that rescued you out of slavery. And all this Passover celebration is all stuff that's gonna happen in the future when they're in the land. They're not even in the land yet, so there can't be aliens living in the land with them. Um, they, they don't have slaves at this point. They're not in the land. This is all future stuff that is to come. You celebrate in the house. It has this really like family feel to it that we remember the rescue and the rescuer while we are in the house, while we're in the land. The place that, that God chooses to dwell in Jerusalem in Jerusalem, they're going to institute the celebration of the Passover. And they're gonna do this as a community where all of Israel will come to Jerusalem to celebrate this Passover. So it's not something that, that happens in silos, but it's something that happens under the context of family. That the covenant family, the people of God remember the rescue and the rescuer. There's this recurring pattern of the firstborn son that takes place throughout the whole Bible. And it, it's so key to God's story of rescue and redemption that the Exodus continues in this pattern, speaking about this firstborn son And the firstborn son belongs to the Lord. And there is, this, there is no length that God won't go to to rescue his children. This redemption pattern requires death for a fuller life. Who in the room is a, uh, a firstborn? Okay. What's that, about maybe half of us, close to half, firstborn sons, firstborn daughters? Um, the firstborn son in this culture would carry so much importance because the firstborn son would take over the responsibility of caring for the family after the father 
had passed on or was no longer able to provide for the family. So the firstborn son would get a, a devil portion or a larger portion of inheritance, but his responsibility was to care for the family when the father couldn't. So this firstborn son has this, um, this place of honor um, and responsibility. Uh, so you can imagine this killing of the firstborn son in Egypt carries this whole um, continued curse that it's going to destroy that family because the firstborn is no longer able to jump into that responsibility that he's called to, to provide for the family. So much of this, like it's hard to talk about this because we already know the answer, right? We're looking back through history and seeing Jesus as the firstborn son that's gonna save all of us later born children. Um, so it's cool that we know the answer to it, but it also takes away a little bit of the, the suspense of how this story uh, plays out. Over and over again, there are stories throughout scripture that foreshadow this firstborn son that is to come. This firstborn son of God, Jesus, that is to come, that is gonna be sacrificed for later born children. That his sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice, is what is going to rescue and ransom and redeem all people. Even Egypt, even Egypt becomes a foreshadow of Jesus. Like this is kind of a, we can trip out on this for a minute, that Egypt would be a foreshadow of Jesus. It was the death it was the death of these Egyptian firstborns that brought the release and rescue and ransom of Israel. Like I had never really thought of it like that. That had never occurred to me that Egypt would be this echo or this foreshadow of Jesus, of the firstborn son. In fact, when I read about God, killing the firstborn. I really struggle with that. Does anybody else kind of trip out on that when you read that God allowed this? All right, thank you. There's a couple of hands out there, right? Whew, thought I was alone for a minute. But I struggle with this idea that God struck down the firstborn of Egypt, right? I mean, Pharaoh seems like a jerk, but surely there's got to be just some average guys working in Egypt, right? Um, their firstborn son is struck dead. So I just, I never really had a satisfactory answer to that. It was just, well, that's how God worked in his sovereignty to rescue his people. But this helps me, this idea that it wasn't a purposeless obliteration of the Egyptian firstborn, but rather the destruction of the firstborn of Egypt paints this beautiful picture of the lengths that God would go to to rescue his people. The lengths that God would go to, the price that God would pay to rescue his covenant people, his firstborn people, I mean, the story of Exodus starts off where Pharaoh is killing the firstborn of Israel. Pharaoh is killing the firstborn of Israel. Pharaoh is putting himself up to be like God to these people. And so throughout these first 12 chapters, over and over again, God is showing 
that he is the one true God, that he is better and more powerful than all of these other Egyptian gods and more powerful than Pharaoh. And yet, in God's ultimate sovereignty, I don't see this as a revenge or a power flex. I see this as a beautiful picture, a foreshadow of how God is going to ransom and rescue the entire world. That there are no lengths that God won't go to to rescue his people. That to me speaks so much more of God's character. That Jesus, this true firstborn, would absorb sin and allow it to kill him to redeem God's people. That Jesus, this foreshadow of the Egyptians, pointing to this Jesus, this firstborn son that is to come, that is going to lay down his life, that is going to become this sacrificial lamb to redeem his people that it'll be Jesus's blood that is poured out, that it will be Jesus's blood that is painted upon the doorpost for this Passover. We, we have to like make this connection between, it seems so obvious, right? The Passover to the Passover lamb, Jesus. All of us, all of us as these later born children all of us by our own actions, even unworthy to be called sons and daughters of God. All of us been rescued by the the sacrifice of the true firstborn son, the eternal son, the one who stepped out from glory, that stepped down from God's space into human space. and lived as this perfect lamb of God that lived this perfect life of obedience. This perfect life of living like a firstborn son, acting like his father, revealing his father, acting in mercy and compassion and truth and justice. All the things that we were called to live by that we were called to be like, Jesus did that. Jesus did that. Laying down his life and allowing sin to kill him. Absorbing the cost for our sin, for our rebellion, becoming that perfect sacrificial lamb If we go back into uh, Genesis, there's a story about Abraham. And Abraham was a man that that waited a very long time to have this child of promise, uh, Isaac. God had promised him that this child would be born to him and his wife, Sarah. And he waited and waited till he was like old, old. And she was old, old as well. And so they have this child of promise, Isaac. And it's awesome and it's like, dang, God fulfilled his promise. Even though we were old as dirt, we had this this child, Isaac, uh, who actually is not the firstborn son. He's a secondborn son because Isaac and Sarah kind of pushed the boundaries with, uh, with a slave maiden of theirs. But this was the actual son of promise that was given to Abraham. And God calls him to sacrifice his son's life. And Abraham in obedience takes this son of promise up a mountain with Isaac carrying the wood for his own destruction. This son of promise climbs a mountain with wood strapped upon his back. But God stops Abraham before he sacrificed Isaac. And he provides a substitution. He provides a ram 
with its horns caught in the thickets to be sacrificed in Isaac's place. This substitution that God has provided all points to Jesus, all points to the firstborn son that was sacrificed for all of humanity. So all of this, all of the the beauty of the Passover is all pointing to the lengths that God will go to to rescue his people. The price that God is willing to pay to rescue his people. This pattern is, is repeated in the Last Supper. That when we do communion, that we, we remember the body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed for us. Jesus instituted this at the Last Supper, which was right before the Passover feast. Like you have to draw, like the connections are so close. It's obvious that the biblical writers are like, okay, guys, you got to get this. This, this Passover feast that Jesus and his disciples are celebrating, this is the new Passover. This is the new, better Passover that is happening. There was no lamb served at the Last Supper because it was the Lamb of God serving his body and his blood at the Last Supper. Right, so at Passover, you would have this lamb that would be killed and cooked in this really specific way with bitter herbs, and you would eat the lamb without breaking the bones, and you wouldn't take it outside, and you would, I guess, eat the organs even though it sounds kind of gross to me, but you would, you would eat this lamb completely. And this would be part of the Passover celebration is you would eat this lamb of God to celebrate the Passover. So now flash forward, Jesus, Jesus is preparing to serve this, this Passover celebration. He is serving the bread, representing his body and the wine representing his blood, the Passover lamb himself serving the communion. That's what John calls him, right? The lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus knows his hour has come and that after this meal, he's going to the cross. And so he institutes this new remembrance this new Passover feast that we're going to remember the body that was broken for us, this lamb of God, the body broken for us. We remember the blood that was shed, that this is the new committed covenant relationship with his people, with his children, with these later born sons. I want us to put on our just first century goggles for a moment, our first century glasses, and imagine, imagine what it would be like to be part of the first century church. So Jesus has been crucified, he's been resurrected, he's ascended. There are these church communities that are popping up everywhere. And the world around us is, is pretty aggressive, but we're just, we're trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. And so we gather and there's maybe 50 of us, 100 of us, probably less than are in this room right now. And we get over at, we get together at uh, Bob's house. I don't know who Bob is, but Bob has a big courtyard where we can all gather. And we, uh, we, who, and if any of us can read, we, we read some of the scriptures or maybe a letter from the apostle. 
and we enjoy one another and we're trying to figure out together what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow the Lamb of God that gave himself up for us, that has redeemed us, that has rescued us? And we share a meal together and we have bread and we have wine and we're told through scripture that, that this bread, this bread that we're enjoying together as a church community, this represents the body that was broken for us. So we, we remember this better Passover, this sacrificial lamb that laid down his body to be broken for us. And then the, the goblet of wine is passed around and we, we take a sip of the juice and we remember the blood that was shed for us, the blood of this lamb that was poured out, this blood that was painted upon the doorpost that we could be passed over by the destroyer. We could be passed over by the destroyer. And somehow this blood also symbolized this whole new covenant of grace that we live under, this whole new relationship with God that has been developed and reformed that no longer do we have to continue to sacrifice bulls and, and lambs and animals, but the sacrifice has been made once for all by the Lamb of God, Jesus. We're going to, um, we're going to celebrate communion together. Uh, we're going to read um, Luke 22 together. And my hope is that as we're remembering the body broken and the blood spilled for us, that we can connect this as the new Passover celebration. Or this is the way we remember not only the rescue, but the rescuer. Sin has disqualified us. Sin has disqualified us from sharing in any of that firstborn authority. That firstborn authority that, that Adam and Eve operated under, where they were the representatives of God here in creation, that they were the ones that imaged God to the world, that they would act in compassion and mercy and justice, that they would be representatives of the king here on earth, as soon as they rebelled, they were disqualified from operating in that place of the firstborn. But now that Jesus has rescued and redeemed us, we get to operate like those firstborn children once again. Because Jesus has ransomed us and redeemed us, from the slavery to sin by his blood, we get to image compassion and mercy and justice to creation. No longer are we disqualified for our sin and our rebellion, but we get to operate in the way that we were always intended to operate because of Jesus. That this is how, this is how we reveal the kingdom. This is how we bring kingdom flourishing into grace deserts. We function as image bearers to God, as image bearers of God. The way you bring kingdom flourishing is you reveal the good reign and rule of God here on earth. you operate the way that God always intended you to operate, imaging God to the world, bringing this flourishing to deserts where it lacks it. All right, Luke 22. Luke 22, the Last Supper the new supper, this new start for God's people. Then the day of unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. 
Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. Listen, he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters. Tell the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs. Make the preparations there. So they went and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread. Let's get our bread out. Our unleavened bread, our symbol, the body of Jesus. This new Passover lamb. He took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The same way, he also took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Lord, we thank you that the links that you go to to rescue and redeem your people, Lord. God, that you would you would become human that you would lay your life down to rescue and redeem your wayward people, Lord. This is the way. This is the way that you have loved us, Lord, by giving yourself to us, Lord. God, I pray that, that you would order all the things that we talked about today, the, the Passover, the Last Supper, the firstborn, Lord, and you would order it in our heads. And God, that you would just give us a greater appreciation for your goodness, Lord, and help us to remember that all of our life you have been so, so good and you continue to be good. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for checking out this message from Kings Harbor. We would love to connect with you. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello and fill out a short connect card, that allows us the opportunity to follow up with you. Also, if this message has been a blessing to your life, we believe that the Lord wants to rule and reign in every part of who we are. That means our time, our talent, our treasure. And so if, if this has been a blessing, we would ask that you would consider contributing back to the ministries of Kings Harbor so we can continue to bless and help people in the same way that we hope we have done for you. With that in mind, we want you to know that our heart towards you and our heart towards the world around us is that we want to be a love forward people. And we're praying that you would join us in that.